Yes, yes. It is with also great honor to bring in the Honorable Inez Barron. Mrs. Barron is the current New York City Councilwoman for District 42. District 42 covers East New York, Brownsville, Canarsie, Starrett City, Spring Creek, and some other parts of Brooklyn. Mrs. Barron is a dynamic, powerful Black woman. Um, beyond politics, she's an educator, an educator for over 30 years. She has been such a great inspiration to me also as an educator. I look to her for strength and power and for inspiration to continue in the path that I am going and continue to go through, which is education. With that being said, Mrs. Barron, you are on. Thank you, thank you. Uh, uh, welcome. Thank you so much. Welcome to the show. Welcome. Welcome. Welcome to the show. Welcome. Thank you. It's an honor. It's an honor to be, asked to be a part of your program this evening. And uh, I understand your theme is talking about self-liberation. And what are some of the examples? Uh, Brother Lewis, I caught part of your presentation and I found it quite inspiring, very informative, and uh, of course, quite accurate. And I do appreciate that. And I mirror and echo much of what it is that you've said, particularly as you talk about Black Wall Street. When you talk about Black Wall Street, you're talking about a collective group of people who came together shortly after uh, the so-called emancipation and the Civil War, and they pooled their money together, and the dollar circulated in their community at least 19 times before it left their community. So that dollar was able to feed so many of the businesses that you talked about that existed in their community. And yes, when it was burned down, they rebuilt it and they didn't give up. And I think it's that kind of communalism that we have to address and also talking about uh, sacrifice, not so much the me and the individualism, but the collective ability to be able to see ourselves as a part of a body not just one person, but a collection of people and talking about that each person bringing their own talents and skills and ability and creating a synergy that is greater than what the individual person's talents are, but working together to be able to make that work. And and Brother Lewis, you said, you know, I don't know, you said something about, you don't know about the reparations, if it's gonna become a reality. Well, we have to keep the hope alive and do the work to make what we want to see happen become a reality. And a part of that work is educating people that reparations, in my opinion, is not just talking about uh, more money in programs that already exist. No, we're already entitled to that kind of social service from the uh, levels of government that oppress us. We're talking about uh, dedicated remedy for the reparations that will be thoughtful and that will reflect the 400 plus years of free uncompensated labor that in fact built this country. We're talking about having a commission established as per legislation that my husband, Assembly Member Charles Barron had passed in the assembly. This legislation is called a reparations remedy and what this does is it establishes a state commission and the state commission will decide what form the reparations is going to take, who's going to be eligible to receive the reparations and how much the reparations will be. You know, we're at odds and bickering and fighting with each other. No, no, it should be this amount. It should be, a, no, it should be 20. We don't even have that yet foundation. We need to get the ability to bring people together to consider what form this reparations might take. And, and the beauty and the uniqueness of the bill that Charles has had passed out of the assembly is that it's a state task force that has more community representatives on it than, ele than elected officials on it. Normally you have the governor and this one and that one appointing people. This commission is going to have two people from ENCOBRA, what is it, the National Coalition of Black Reparations in America, two representatives from December 12th movement headed by Viola Plummer, and two representatives from the Institute of the Black World headed by Ron Daniels. So that's six people 
who are community-based people looking like all of us who are on the screen. The other members of that reparations uh, remedy committee is going to be a representative of the governor, two representatives from the uh, Senate and two appointees from the assembly. So that's five. So we have five elected officials representing the systemic system that we're working in and six from the community, people who have a longstanding history of understanding the, the broad expanse of what reparations should require and who look like us. And we're going to make sure that the expertise that they have is reflected in what we bring forward. Now, what's the importance of that? The importance of that is that the process, which will come to a product which they produce uh, after I think it's uh, a year, I'm not sure of the length of the commission, but they will come up with a process that has our input not one that has been crafted by those who have oppressed us for all those years and who are now saying how they think we should be compensated, but one that will, it'll be a body of people coming together that reflect what we understand to be, we'll ask for a testimony from all elements of the uh, society and that will be presented in a form. Now, the next issue is, yes, it's passed out of the state assembly but there's another body, the state Senate. We have to bring pressure to bear on our state senators for them to bring this bill to a vote and pass it out of the Senate. And then we have to bring pressure to bear on the governor for him to sign it. So now, you know, we're talking about Juneteenth and last year, the governor, Governor Cuomo, said that uh, Juneteenth was gonna be a holiday and, that, and they were gonna be uh, paid for those who are state workers. Okay, so now you got your Juneteenth. Literally, this is what he said. You got your, your Juneteenth holiday. Now go back home, settle down and get back to what it was that you were doing. What? So he saw that as tossing a bone to us to say, okay, here, take this and go back disperse, go back to business as usual. I heard him say, those were not his exact words, but that was the intent of what he said. I heard him say that and I said, it's here still, he doesn't get it. It's not some kind of trinket, some kind of individual um, um, executive order or decision that you make that you consider you've done something so magnanimous that now we should be satisfied. We have got to fight. We've got to continue to bring the pressure be in the streets, make those phones ring, send those emails and get what it is that we deserve. And, and if, um, I think I needed to, um, I just wanted to share with you, we talk about um, reparations and the fight for reparations. You may have heard of Jordan Anderson. How many of you heard of Jordan Anderson, the letter that he wrote? Mm -hmm. oh, okay, good. If I can find it quickly in my book. <laughs> Take your um, time. Yes, yeah, somebody call me. No, we got we, this. Is our show, we can take it. We'll oh, find okay, it. Good, good. All right, we, so, we we own this. We own this. All right. Jordan <laughs> Anderson had been enslaved, I believe, in Texas, and they left he and his wife, and they went to Ohio. Um, his former enslaver asked for him to return. You know, they they can't. Those folks didn't know how to work the land and till the land. And so he asked for them to come back and he would do well by him and make everything fine. Um, okay, I think I found it. So Jordan Anderson responded to the request for him to go back and work for his former master. Okay, Derek thinks so he, he's heard this before. Okay, good, good. So here's the letter, excerpts from the letter that Jordan Anderson wrote. To my old master, Colonel P.H. Anderson, Big Spring, Tennessee. Sir, I got your letter and was glad to find that you had not forgotten Jordan and that you wanted me to come back and live with you again, promising to do better for me than anybody else can. I have often felt uneasy about you. I thought the Yankees would have hung you before this for harboring ribs they found in your house. I suppose they never heard about your going to Colonel Martin to kill the Union soldier that was left by his company in their stable. Although you shot at me twice before, 
I left you. I did not want to hear of your being hurt, and I'm glad you're still living. Uh, I want to know particularly what the good chance is you propose to give me. I'm doing tolerably well here. I get $25 a month with victuals and clothing. We have a comfortable home, and, and Mandy and the folks, they call her Mrs. Anderson, they go to children, go to school, and are learning well. Now, if you will write and say what wages you will give me, I'll be better able to decide whether it should be to my advantage to move back again. As to my freedom, which you say I can have, there's nothing to be gained on that score as I got my free papers in 1864 from the Provost Marshal of the Department of Nashville. Mandy says she'd be afraid to go back without some proof that you will dispose of truth that's justly and kindly. And we have concluded to test your sincerity by asking you to send us our wages for the time we served you. This will make us forget and forgive all scores and rely on your justice and friendship in the future. I served you faithfully for 32 years and Mandy 20 years. At $25 a month for me and $2 a week for Mandy, our earnings would amount to $11,680. Add to this the interest for the time our wages have been kept back and deduct what you paid for our clothing and the three doctor's visits for me and pull on the tooth for Mandy. And the balance will show that we in justice are entitled to. Please send the money by Adams Express, care of Dr. Williams. If you fail to pay us, for our faithful labors in the past, we can have little faith in your promise in the future. We trust the good maker has opened your eyes to the wrongs which you and your fathers have done to me and my fathers in making us toil for you for generations without recompense. Here, I draw my wages every Saturday night, but in Tennessee, there was never any payday for the Negroes any more than for the horses and the cows. Surely there will be a day of reckoning for those who defraud labor in, in hire. Uh, say howdy to George Carter and thank him for taking the pistol from you when you were trying to shoot at me. So, you know, it, it's a interesting representation, but the fact that we have always known that we have in, been entitled to what uh, our ancestors paid, what our ancestors, and there were always people who were willing to raise the question of reparations. So in 1783, one of the first people to ask for reparations was Belinda Sutton, who had been enslaved in Massachusetts. Yes, there was slavery in the North. It wasn't just south of the Mason-Dixon. So Belinda Sutton uh, brought, um, brought a suit and asked for pensions from the estate of the person who had enslaved her. And she was granted 15 pounds for her and her daughter, but they only made one or two payments and then they didn't continue. If we talk about Tunis Campbell in 1865, he established a government of black people at St. Catherine's Island, one of the sea islands. And they had a militia to protect themselves against the KKK. They had a president, they had a government, they had a judicial system, a legislative system, but then, as you know, Reconstruction was pulled back and they took back the land which they had granted to them. That's where that 40 acres and a mule came from. They took that back. And so he wasn't able to continue to develop that land. Jordan Anderson, I just read you his letter. Callie House in Tennessee in 1898, she started the National Ex-Slave Mutual Relief Bounty and Pension Association. And in the matter of about 12 years, from 1898 to 1900, it grew to over 300,000 people who were a part of that organization. What did they do? Same thing that they had, had done the Marcus Garvey. They charged her with fraud. They charged her with fraud, just as they brought those uh, fallacious claims against Marcus Messiah Garvey. We heard about Marcus Messiah Garvey and for those of us who live here in New York, Queen Mother Moore. If you ever met Queen Mother Moore or ever heard her speak, 
her phrase was pay me my reparations pay me my reparations and she also was a proud member active member of the unia member of the communist party people get scared when you talk about mm -hmm. communism member of the communist party and, and the founder of the universal association of ethiopian women so those are just some of the personalities that were uh demanding their reparations they weren't sitting back passive docile content they knew that they had an entitlement and they took action to seek that payment of the debt that was owed to them for all the years that they had been uncompensated and we talk about this society this country and sometimes we don't acknowledge that yeah it's a great success economically because they didn't have to pay for land they didn't have to pay for labor they stole the land from the indigenous people and they enslaved the africans and made them work without compensation so that's a, a business plan that's certainly going to succeed in terms of of the uh, economic windfall that they gather from that so all of the great uh achievements that you see in this country and much also not just of the economics but of the culture the history the literature the music uh the the inventions came from us that we were the ones that had that stolen from us so when we talk about reparations and when we talk about the hardships that our people endured we've got to continue to fight and make that demand uh i'm sure there were people who thought that nelson mandela would never be free he's he was freed and became the president so i would just want to encourage us to continue to think that Yes, it's it's a goal that's uh elusive. It has been elusive now, but we have a bill that has been passed in the state assembly that is going to establish a reparations remedy task force and it's generated with people who look like us. So, it, it's certainly within our grasp and within our reach and something that we can achieve and do and there are other cities as well. This is the time. This is the time. Uh the the death, the tragic death, the murder of George Floyd has sent uh messages oh sorry sent messages all across this country and the world of the injustices that this country has perpetrated on black brown and people of low income and color but talking now about black and brown people and it sent that message all across the world and we know that uh, that's got to be got to be uh responded to so as we talk about uh doing for self liberating ourselves uh, i believe it was said that you know we were passive waiting for the for the union soldiers to come and tell us that we had so called been liberated we know of course that abraham lincoln didn't free the slaves so called slaves because what his order said applied to states that he had no jurisdiction over so that's like somebody coming in my house and and telling my children oh you don't have to go to bed at 8:00 you can say up to 12 no not in my house so it's that same kind of parallel you can't impose uh um your uh, laws over a country or a people that you have no jurisdiction of so we were a part of the 300,000 uh union soldiers and some of the literature that talks about that on the Rome Bennett's book Forced into Glory and Like Men of War by Noah Andre the black troops in the civil war and the introduction to black studies by Melana Karanga so there's lots of documentation that speaks to that and it's there for us to be able to refer to and to share with our children and to spread the word because you know back in the 60s we had an expression um how you going to make the black nation rise you got to agitate educate and organize so that organization is only going to happen when people come to another point in their mind that they're great they have a great history a great culture they have made significant contributions and and despite those um tv shows an ilk of all kinds very few of which very few of which talk about our greatness and our history and our grandeur you know present a a, a very limited kind of presentation you know this is the 21st century amos and andy as far as i'm concerned much of what i'm seeing on tv in terms of black 
It doesn't elevate us. It doesn't feature us in our greatness in many respects. And it's a stereotypical presentation. So we've got to reclaim what's ours. We've got to let our children know of their greatness and their history. We've got to support them because they're not going to see it on TV. Uh, they may not have learned it from their parents because we rely on the, the educational system that is not built to, um, to, to make us feel our good. It's built to have our children conform, follow the rules, not be expressive in contradiction to what it is that uh, is the, the general way of what's to be done and get in line and do what everybody else is doing. It doesn't foster creativity and it certainly doesn't encourage um, out of the box thinking in many regards. So we've gotta be very careful about who we turn our children over to for them to, to take their minds and to plant those seeds, you know, uh, of, of hope or seeds of doubt. What's it gonna be that we put in? So, sister, yeah. No, Sister Anna, I got one quick question. Before, and I know, I know I don't wanna hold up your time and stuff like that. I truly appreciate you coming on. But why do what, why do black people, why does us, we always have to wait and get task force for everything, like the, the anti-lynching bill, Juneteenth, we always have to get something kind of studies for us, but other people always, LGBTQ get this, they can just walk in the door and get stuff. Asian people got an anti-hating bill just like that. So how do we, <laughs> why do we always have to have a hurdle before we get what we want? I think in part because we don't have a collective base. Mm -hmm. I think in part because we don't have an ongoing voice that we raise uh, consistently. I think in part because many of us don't think that we're entitled to it. You know, mm -hmm. many of us have bought into the fact that, oh, we're never, it's never, we're not going to get it. So why bother to even try? Why bother to fight? So now mm -hmm. you remember in New York when uh, they talked about, again, Charles Barron and others talked about changing the criteria for admission to the elite high schools, style mm -hmm tech. What happened? How many thousands and thousands of Asians came and said, oh, no, we're not taking that test away. How many thousands, and I mean that literally, came out and objected? How many of them said that? So much so that some, somebody, one of our brothers who had announced that he was uh, in favor of finding other alternatives or other measures to allow admission uh, about a week later said, you know what, uh, I, I, maybe we can still keep the test. How do you as a black person say we can keep the test when that test has shown itself to be the measurement and the instrument by which black children are denied access to that school? How do you do that? How, how do you justify making a public statement at the announcement that we're gonna find other measures to admit Asia, uh, black children to these schools where predominantly Asians and whites are. And then a week later, he said, you know what? Uh, I thought about that. And uh, uh, I think we can keep the test. So, so how do we get rid of those chumps, right? We don't need those chumps, right? Those are suckers. I mean, Ms. Well, I, I'm, I as, I'm not at work today. I'm on Let's Chop It Up. So I'm going to okay. talk free. How do we do so, that? We so. do our research. <laughs> we do our research. Uh, probably, and I'm not going to call the name. But uh, probably, come on. Drop the uh, team. <laughs> I'll give you a clue. I'll give, give you a, a clue. clue. Give me a clue. I'll give you a hint. Because you know, sometimes people do a little work to get. Find out who was at the press conference announcing that other measures would be used for admission to the specialized high schools and see what that person's position was a week later. All right. Nah, I'll do that. I'll do that. But here's my other thing. Thank is there any possible way? I'm, this is my last final question. I know it's getting late tonight. How can, like, instead of us trying to go to their schools, right? The Stuyvesants, let's call it out. The all the schools, the Bronx High School Science. I, I'm going to let's chop it up. So I'm going to say what I'm going to say right now, right? How do we get those in our East New Yorks, our South Jamaicas, our South Bronx? We don't need them anymore. Like we exactly. said before, like we had our own system, the school system before. We got our, our own historical black colleges. How can we right. start? How can people start in their basements and stuff and it's like form together? Like, we don't need them anymore. As, we never needed them. Never needed. Yeah, we never need them because we we built right. stuff out of nothing. 
Think about the, right. we, you know, we built stuff out of and like we didn't have anything and we got all these inventions. Right. The, the, the real McCoys. It's, it's, it's very <laughs> true. And, and the who we give our children over to, to educate them is so critical. Uh, I've been, at, as Amiri said, I was with the Board of Education for 36 years. So I spent 18 years in the classroom and I spent 18 years in other supervisory positions and I did retire as a principal. But I understood how important it was that my young black sons be in an environment that appreciated them, elevated them, valued them and, and nurtured them. And it was for that reason that I put my son, when he was born, my oldest son, into a very small church run school. And when I say small, I mean small. The starting class had five students. Wow. Okay. And it never grew beyond 20 students for the six years that it was in operation. My second son was born. Uh, that institution was no longer there. I found another black church run school that I was comfortable with because I knew they had a black curriculum. The first church, the first school was the House of the Lord Elementary School. And I'm a member of the House of the Lord and I'm an educator. So I knew what they were going to do with my child. And the second child, the second school was Bible Way Learning Center, uh, which was a school operated by Bible Way. They had a slightly larger student body. And I would say at one point it must have grown to maybe 150 students. But why aren't they still around? Because you, we weren't charging the tuition that would have been needed to pay a, a decent salary. So if you only have 10 students and you have three teachers teaching these 10 students, and if you wanted to pay the teachers a salary that they would be commensurate with, had they, it's going to take a lot of money. And it wasn't our intention to try to, you know, go into the parents' pockets and empty them and turn them out. So we weren't able to sustain that because we didn't take grant money from those big corporations. You know, when you take whoever is bringing you to the dance, that's what you, that's what you have to dance with, right? So if they're paying the costs, you're obligated to them. So we never took grant money, uh, and we were reliant just on the tuition that parents paid which was really nominal. So it didn't sustain it, but you may be called the East, Uhuasasa. Okay, that, that was G2AUC, Les, his name was Les Campbell and, and uh, Sam Penn had a huge Afrocentric school. It used to be at the Armory on mm. uh, Troop Avenue, I think it is. Mm. And, and it was massive and it generated a lot of people from that. You may know Adiyad and Bandeli and others of that ilk. They came through that because we understood in the 60s, that whole revolutionary period, and there were people who were willing to take what we call missionary wages to do that teaching. So, you know, they got a nominal amount, nowhere near what a teacher earns in the public school system. So it's a matter of sacrifice. It's a matter of sacrifice. And it's a matter of finding people who believe in what you're doing and you know, if they have those kinds of no strings attached programs that they can give money, that would be one way for the school. But in order to you know get the materials that you need and the technology that you need, it's a big sacrifice. Now there are other schools, as you say, that started in people's basements. You know, another school, another uh, institution for black children, where my grandchildren are now going is Little Sun People, a fantastic institution for children from two to five, you know, uh, and what they do with their children, what they do, the, the, the grandeur that the children have and the confidence that they have, and they learn to play violin as well, but they got the African drummers and they got the African dancers. I, I would encourage you to look up Little Sun People. It's right in Restoration uh, on Fulton Street in Brooklyn, operated by Mama Fela, who's operated that school, I think for 40 years, 40 mm -hmm. years. And it's been a struggle. It's been a struggle. Wow. And that's what it's going to take. Uh, yeah. I think it was someone whose last name was Feely, or was the first name was Feely, who said, until you understand racism, everything else you think you understand will only confuse you. Wow. So until you find out and re recognize what this system in this country 
has institutionalized and perpetuated through all manner of systems. So you understand that when you try to make sense of other kinds of things, it's going to be a challenge. It's very difficult. So in order for us to do that, we would have to make a major sacrifice. I think it would take people who have that kind of commitment to come together and say, listen, this is what we're going to do. And this is how we're going to do it. And you have to have parents who are supportive. That would mean parents would have to be engaged in some kind of cooperative venture and volunteer some time and volunteer other kinds of things. And unfortunately, our parents are so burdened, I'll say, by the day-to-day -day living that they oftentimes don't go to the board meetings and the meetings for decisions about what's going to happen and don't challenge a lot, you know, so. Sister Inez, thank you for, listen, you're right about that with the parents. I know we are trying to stay on our schedule tonight. We truly appreciate you coming on. I Bring, appreciate being here. You're still an educator, as you see. You can never, once you're educated, you can't stop being always, an educator. Always, always. That's you know? my gift. Uh, <laughs> That's my God-given gift. And I yeah. acknowledge that, and I always want to pay tribute to that. Yep, and it's always going to shine through, and we truly appreciate you. Thank Tell you. Charles, I give him a hug. I love the brother, too. You know, okay. I see him, hope to see you soon. I haven't seen you since last year. So hopefully we get to see one another in person soon, maybe at the center. Very Thanks. good. And I want to invite everybody, your listening audience, everyone to come to our Juneteenth program, which is going to be held this Friday, June the 18th. And it's going to be held at what we call Sunny Carson Park. The mm -hmm. Park Department has it listed as Linden Park. We call it Sunny Park Carson Park on Linden Boulevard in Vermont. And it is from five to seven this Friday. We're going to have, our theme is resistance from Tulsa Race Massacre to the Brooklyn Underground Railroad. Uh, there was a battle that was recently won to preserve the house at 227 Duffield Street. Mama Joy Chattel, black woman, a sister, had purchased the house maybe, maybe 20 years ago. And with the downtown development, they wanted to demolish the house. And she said, no, 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 because there are tunnels and chambers underneath this house that are not necessarily what you would find in a house. And this house was at one point occupied by abolitionists. And we want to preserve it as a stop on the Underground Railroad. Long story short, it's been a 20 year battle uh, through several mayors and several landmarking commissions but we have finally gotten that house landmarked. And so it's been protected from being demolished. Uh, and Mama Joy Chattel passed away, but her daughter, Shanae Lee, has been carrying in the battle and she's gonna be one of the keynote speakers at our event. So this Friday, June 18th, it's outdoors in Sunny Carson Park, also known as Linden Park, from five to seven, everyone's invited. We're gonna have African drumming, we're gonna have a beautiful presentation by Victory Music and Dance. If you've never seen them, you're in for a treat. And we're gonna have spoken word and two speakers, one speaking about Duffield Street in Brooklyn and the other about the Tulsa massacre. So you're all welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming thank on. You. We love you. Thank you for our presence. Thank and God thank you for educators. And everybody come out to the event at Sunny Carson Park on Linden Boulevard. Uh, AKA Landing Park. But now, just, no, just like, but anyway, thank you, sister, for coming thank on. You. Talk to you soon. Love bye you. Bye bye. Thank you. All right.